Welcome to Measured Thoughts. Today I'm delighted to be joined by William Lauder from the Estee Lauder's Companies. Welcome. Thank you. I'm glad, glad to, to have here. you with me, William. Why don't you tell us how big is Estee Lauder today in terms of number of employees, sales, number of brands, etc.? To put it in perspective, Estee Lauder Company, Estee Lauder the brand, was founded by my grandparents, Estee and Joseph Lauder, in 1946. In 1958, my father, Leonard Lauder, also a graduate of Wharton, joined the company after a three-year stint in the Navy, and the company was doing $800,000 in sales on a global basis. Today, we're a family of 27 different brands doing business in 130 companies in the world. We have approximately 27,000 employees, and we'll do somewhere around $7.8 to $8 billion in sales on a net basis for our next fiscal year. In North America, we've got three brands, with each with a network of between 120 and 160 of their own stores, Origins, Mac, and Aveda. We also have a group of stores which we call the Cosmetics Company Store, which are sold primarily in off-price malls, taking excess merchandise that is created by the brands and or returned by the retailers, which we sell. They are both past operations which operate in certain places, for example, in our office building in New York, as well as some other large buildings. We used to have a very successful operation in the World Trade Center before that tragedy. And there's perhaps about a dozen of them that operate in other parts of the world outside of North America. The key principle behind all of our retail operations for any of our brands is that the brand's control of their image is so important. And each brand, retail, has a different level of significance and importance. So for example, I've named the brands like Origins, Mac, and Aveda, which have a meaningful presence in North America. Clinique has a couple of retail stores in North America. Estee Lauder brand has a couple of retail stores in North America. Um, Joe Malone has a handful of stores in North America. But Joe Malone is a British band, brand, which we acquired a few years ago. And they have quite a number of stores in the UK. And their core authority emanates from their own retail presence in the UK, where it had a really strong cult following. And we're trying to graph that into a success in North America, as well as other parts of the world. Let's talk about looking across the brands. Are there some objectives that you set across all the brands that are common? Or does each brand have its own unique objectives? There are common standards that we expect every brand is going to perform to, and those are pretty much rock solid. We have an expression for our company which is bringing the best to everyone we touch. That means that we are expected to deliver the best service, the best experience, the best quality product to the consumer within the mission of your brand. I have another expression which is great brands, great people. Across the board, we are looking to have the very best brands in every single category in which we compete. And the only way we're going to do it is if we have the very best, most talented people leading those brands and at every level of the company. We're spending a great deal of time and effort and resources in making sure that we're developing the best talent inside of our company, identifying them, and developing their skills and abilities so they can be fabulous. So help me to try and understand the role of marketing at Estee Lauder. It's got a to, it's got to play a dominant role. So what do you see the role of marketing within the company? Well, the marketing, def marketing responsibilities and roles, as we define it in our company, is the central nexus of the decision making of any brand at any given time. The marketing executives are responsible for developing the concepts for new product and branding and positioning, working closely with their product development partners and their creative partners in creating new great brand ideas, working very closely with the sales organizations in making this message relevant to their consumer, to the trade, understanding what makes it successful, and maintaining the mission. Essentially, when I look back at the history and the success of our company, any one brand and the collective of our company, it's having that intuition and imagination to know where consumers want and give it to them almost before she knew she wanted it. And that's a messaging and a marketing position. Is that creating that demand or is it recognizing what that demand is? It, it, I had to stop you in that, baby. almost before she knew that she wanted it. It's that you understand what it is that she wants or are you creating what it is that she wants? I think it's both. 
she may want it, but she may not, it may not have been able to articulate it in such a way that someone says, okay, yes, I know what you want, I'll give it to you, as much as to say, can I imagine what she wants, where she wants to go, or create something new where she says, aha, that's what I want, I love it, let me go there. You, it's sort of a chicken and egg thing. You can't say she didn't know she wanted it. Well, she knew she wanted it, she just couldn't articulate it in a way, but when she saw it, she knew she'd like it. You said something about the role of marketing within the company. If I brought the CFO in here and asked him or her, I don't even know if it's a him or her, would I get the same answer from the CFO? I would imagine you would get the same answer from the CFO that marketing and the decision making around the marketing organization is central to the success of our company. I believe that's a core principle that everybody has. The vast majority of our leadership in our company has grown up in the sales and marketing organization. And if you've grown up in the sales side of the organization, you've got a very intimate working knowledge of the marketing organization. If you've grown up on the marketing side of the organization, you have a very intimate knowledge of the sales side. And a good business leader has a co understanding of the total business, but with a strength and expertise in one area, which they can bring and complement their skill sets with experts in other areas. Then with this understanding of marketing at the Estee Lauder company, um, let me understand the budgeting side. So I went from the CFO, talking about the CFO, to thinking about putting together the budget. Each brand has a budget. How does the, each brand come up with their budget? Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because we're in the very last rows of putting together our budgets for the next fiscal year, and the process oftentimes is sausage making at its ugliest. But it starts with we give the brands targets in certain key metrics, and we give them targets based on how we would roll up the performance of the total company, look at our commitment over a three to five year cycle, and say we need to be here as a company. Here are the performance metrics of each of the brands that we've seen historically. And we go back to the brand and say, this is the target we have for you for sales growth. This is the target we have for you for cost of goods improvement. This is the target we have for you in operating I'm expenses. I'm going to write these down. Sales growth. Uh, now, sales growth is a function, if you will. We have a key core metric. We've committed to delivering to our shareholders improved performance and return on invested capital and EPS growth. Those are the two key core financial metrics which we promise to deliver to our shareholders. From that, we build operating budgets that look to sales growth on the top line, operating expense improvements, and cost of goods improvements. Those are the three key metrics that will drive operating income. Mm -hmm. The brand managers have certain leeway in certain areas. They do not have leeway in quality control. They must deliver the highest quality product, period, end of story. And none of us, unfortunately, have much say in taxes. We try to manage our tax exposures as best we can, but the fact of the matter is, is that's not a brand management decision. That's a corporate decision in how we work out our corporate exposures to taxes around the world. We also do not demand from our brand managers to be victims of or beneficiaries of uh, swings in currency. They manage their businesses on a current, constant currency basis. And we as a company will manage currency globally to the best interest of the company. How do you set those sales goals? History and ambition and reality. And the negotiation is that rea is history, ambition, and reality is somewhere in between. And is that fairly uniform across brands, or does each brand have its own particular? Each brand has its own particular sales goals based on its historical trend. If you have a grow brand growing at 20% and they come in and say, I'm going to grow five next year, we tell them to go away and come back with a realistic trend. If you have a brand growing at 5% and they come in and say, I'm going to deliver you 20, we want to know why and we want to know what the investment is behind it and what is the certainty of delivering the top line for the certainty of the spend. Let's say you have a brand and their goal for next year is to grow by 10%. Take me through the steps of how does that translate into a budget? Brand has a 10% sales growth goal. We would look to them to have at a 20 basis point improvement in cost of goods. We would look to them to grow their operating expense at 6%, no more than 6%, so that there would be an increase in their margin, so both driven by cost of goods and operating expense. And if the net math of that is, is if they're growing their sales at 10% and their operating expense at 6%, we've got a 4% improvement in operating income. 
that budgeting process is a negotiation in both the top line, how much you're going to grow it, and the bottom line, how much you have to spend to fuel the growth. When you realize, I, I look at it across all of our brands, there's only four lines in our P&L where the brand spends towards the consumer. Cost of goods and the quality of the product and the packaging. Advertising, promotion, and selling expense. Selling expense being how we represent our brand to the consumer at retail. So you as a brand manager have a given cost of general administrative expenses, all the salaries and occupancy ex expenses associated with it. But where you have real input and you can have real levers to manage your business in this, those four lines, you only have certain leeway within cost of goods because you've got a historical business built up with certain products with certain cost of goods. How can you improve that? How can you add new product programming with beneficial cost of goods that moves the number meaningfully? Advertising, how much and where are you advertising? What's that medium? What's the voice? That's built market by market by market. One of my favorite examples is commuting media. Commuting media is those media where you communicate to those consumers who are commuting to work. Well, in the United States, commuting media is predominantly radio. And in certain markets, it might be billboard. And in a handful of markets where mass transit is a factor, it might be some form of mass transit community, uh, me messaging. When we go to Japan, where 95% of the population that commutes takes public transportation, commuting media is 100% mass transit. Radio's not relevant. And I use those just as examples to say the definition of commuting media changes market by market in the world. If you go to Korea, we have something like an 80% online penetration factor. Communi communicating with the consumer through online messages, which is highly targeted, can be far more effective than in markets where you have a 20% penetration online. Right. So how the brand builds their spend and an advertising and communications message is, is market by market and also brand specific. Brand specific, market specific, how do you evaluate whether or not the spending ended up being productive? The ultimate crucible is the success of the brand in the marketplace. And I'll give you an example. When I travel to certain markets in the world, one of their pitches to us is, is they show us their market share, total market, and then they look at their share of voice. And they, we, they, we try to look at the benchmark of share of voice versus market share. One of the consistent messages I get back from our, our, our brands around the world is, is that our share of voice is lower than our market share. Meaning you're more productive? Meaning, but thank you very much. They're looking to argue that they want more money and share a voice. I'm looking to say, congratulations. Look at how much more efficient you are than your competition because you're spending less to get more in this one area. And they look at it saying, OK, fine. But why is that? That's because we as a company tend to spend much more money at the consumer at retail. The consumer who's already in the store will spend more than our competition. They may spend more with the voice in getting her there, but we spend more when she's there. And we think we convert that better because of the value of the exposure to the consumer who's come in. Is that because of your selling expense? It's predominantly selling expense. And if you will, the, pr the promotional expense is somewhere in between. It's not all branding and imaging, what advertising is. It's not all selling expense, what goes on in the store. It's somewhere in between, and it's more of a call to action to get that consumer into the store and convert the sale when she's there. OK. So we've covered sort of your, uh, your budgeting process and how you evaluate that. What measures do you typically look at? Uh, beyond, of course, you just went through sales, cost of goods sold. You're looking at the margins. I'm trying to think about sort of interim measures that you might have. For example, do you measure brand and brand's equity? There's no real way to measure brand equity in the way that Robert Parker says this is a 95-point wine. Brand equity is this, it's like trying to grab mercury. The, but the core of it is, is this brand desirable? Is this brand strong? And are consumers coming back for the brand? So we would look at a program and say, what kind of imagery are we building from this? Is this stimulating attention and interest to the brand? And there are so many different ways of doing it. And one of the things I think I mentioned before is the conventions, the conventional conventions of looking at traditional media and their, their ability to drive consumers have so dramatically changed 
that the old metrics need to, have, need to change along with them. And I don't think our metrics of measurement have changed as fat quickly as the consumer has changed. For example, what we found for our own brands is that the brands that have not used conventional advertising, print, radio, television, have been growing faster than the brands that were dependent on the more traditional forms. That doesn't mean that the page rate from the magazines hasn't gone up. That doesn't mean that the ad rate for the network te television hasn't gone up. Or maybe it has. I'm, that's maybe not a good example. But the fact of the matter is, is that the brands that had grown up on more traditional forms have not had the same growth as the brands that used alternative forms. But you've got 27 brands, really great, strong brands. Uh, do you know whether or not the brands are getting stronger or weaker as a brand, or are you looking just at the sales of the brand? Well, the sales of the brand in one way, shape, or form are one of the key blood pressures of the brand. You could, to really take the key vital signs, you have to look at sales. Why do you have to look at sales? The consumer is voting every single day with her wallet. Right. And if she's voting for the brand more this year than last year, then we would presume that she, we are successful. If she's voting less, then we presume that we're missing on some metric. So what about spending that has an impact on a short-term basis versus spending that doesn't immediately result in sales but has a longer-term uh, value? That's a fabulous question. And um, let me refer you to some work that we did with the Clinique brand um, in one of the most competitive markets in the world, which is Japan. For in our industry in Japan, it's probably the single most competitive market for any number of reasons because it's an extraordinarily sophisticated consumer. It's a relatively compact, homogenous market from both a distribution standpoint and a cultural and psychographic standpoint. So the result is, is that the programming and measuring measurements you can put into this brand with a limited number of doors and the very high productivity, you see the results fairly quickly, positive or negative with an extraordinarily sophisticated and demanding consumer. The Clinique brand was the first and most successful imported non-Japanese brand for many, many years. And the brand went into a period of years of flatness, if not decline, in share. That came from a number of different factors, number one of which was there was a lot more competition of imported brands coming in, and it had the most share to lose because it had a dominant share. But just as importantly, there was some key work that we needed to do in understanding the messaging of the brand that was no longer as relevant. So we took a very deep dive for this brand in Japan and we found was, we found was in understanding the equity of the brand was that over time the principles that had built the brand had come to be perceived as cold and not connecting with the consumer in the same way. So we started doing work to understand how we can change that and what we did was we started investing four years ago in a more humanizing messaging element for the brand at all different factors. The national advertising image, to your point, that's a long-term brand equity investment. The in-store investment in the experience the consumer got at so, store. So you're real to tolerant of, you know, we're investing right now, we're probably not going to meet some of those financial objectives short term, but we're building something that long term is going to help us. Brands are not made overnight, and brands are not killed overnight, except for extraordinary problems. So therefore, we have to have a level of patience of investment. And to your, one of your questions you asked is about resource allocation. There's that traditional BCG model of you have the dogs, the star, the cow, and whatnot. We invest according, not according to some strict model, but we will tend to invest both in brands that are growing and you have to invest in the growth of the brand and perhaps not demand the same profit level and the brands that are very highly profitable not growing as much we will demand a certain level of performance so we can harvest some of their success and excess return to invest in new brands the fact of the matter is is that i would attribute over eighty percent of the sales of our company today to brands we've created ourselves almost all of those we were making bets and making investments long before they paid off. Some of them, unfortunately, I'm still waiting for the payoff, but we've gotten tremendous return on our investment
because of the investments we've made in our brand and the branding we've created and the positioning we've created. And one of the key strategic objectives for our company is to continue to have brands that the consumers want and that the retailers want. And we almost, in the balance of power, we always have to have more of what the consumer wants so that the retailer always wants to be our partner and doesn't feel like we're tapped out intellectually. One last measure I'm going to ask you about, do you measure the value of a customer? I, what I'm referring to is the lifetime value of a customer. If you get a person to become a cus customer of Clinique, you know, what kind of revenue you're going to be generating from that customer over their entire lifetime? You're talking about one of the single biggest opportunities we have in the future, which is intimate, more intimate knowledge of the consumer. Now, this issue crashes against the principle of the ownership of that consumer. And we have been in a historical arm wrestling match with our key retailers as to who owns that consumer. Does the retailer own that consumer? Do we own that consumer? Do we share, her, share that knowledge and how do we do it? How much does the retailer know about her and her buying patterns in our category? How much are they willing to share with us so we can come to understand it more? I'd say where we were 10 years ago, the retailer said, that's my customer. All you, can, you can't know anything about her. Today, we're in a much closer partnership with our retailers. We're both learning more about our consumer how she shops, where she shops, why she shops, and how we can get learn more about her as they're coming to realize that assets delivered to the best customers return multiples more than assets aimed at the consumer who's a lapsed consumer. The research we've done shows that there's a six to one difference in investment. Assets invested at a core consumer will return you six times that that same money devoted to a lapsed, not a lapsed user, someone who's never been your customer. Oftentimes, we've been guilty brand by brand in focusing our efforts at recruitment, new consumer, and haven't devoted enough to retainment and, uh, of that consumer who's already there. And as we shift our resources and knowledge to that more existing consumer, I think we'll get a better, more effective use of our. But the form in which we communicate with that loyal consumer is a very different form than we might find in broad general advertising. This goes back to that media change. The, the, the way the consumer shops the brand and understands brands today is so different that the traditional forms, what's one of the real areas where I'm so concerned about the relevance of traditional media versus new media? The last area that I'm going to ask you about is about your relationship as CEO with the different brand managers. How do you interface with them? Is it at arm's length or do you partner with them since you have the CEO and CMO under one office? I try to focus most of my effort on with the brand managers somewhat on a personal level, somewhat on a brand level. When I say a personal level, at the end of the day, I would say, I, how do I allocate my time? I spend a third of my time on strategic implications for the company, a third of my time on people, and a third of my time on everything else. Everything else being what's happening today, what came across the transom last week, what do I th see as a big issue that's coming forward. And I'll, with a brand manager, for example, I spend a lot of my time with the brand leadership on key appointments, whether it's the key appointment of a new brand leader when an opportunity comes up, key appointments in their marketing area, the product development area, or the sales area. I let them make decision making on everything else and working with them on the key challenges they have in front of them. Where can I add value? And my value add is different brand by brand, both based on the relationship I have with the brand manager as well as my own personal passion and expertise for certain brand. For example, no surprise, I take a great deal of passion about the leadership in the Origins brand, since it's a brand that I was right. intimately involved in its formation. And that's very different, say, than the passion my father, Leonard Lauder, has for the Estee Lauder brand, which he's been intimately involved with since the start. And that's just an example. The other examples will be, what are the challenges we have going forward for a brand and the brand leadership? I don't get involved in the choice of shades of lipstick. I leave that up to those who are far more expert than me. I talk to the brands about the key metrics that drive their business. What's the brand equity? How are you enhancing the brand equity? One of the analogies I use is that brand equity, brand imagery, is like a road. Certain roads are country lanes, two lanes, and it's very clear to know when you're on the road in your brand or whether something you're doing is off message. But certain other brands are eight-lane highways. It's very hard to know when you're on or off the road because there's such latitude and leeway. 
So a lot of the time I spend with the brand managers is clearly identifying what the key metrics are in the brand equity and how they continue to need to push it. The open and honest communications you have with your brand managers, the, the latitude you give them and the guidance you provide are all essential traits that you have and are necessary for a great leader to build a wildly successful company. Thank you. That's all the time that we have here today at Measured Thoughts, but I would like to thank William for joining us and sharing his insights about the Estee Lauder's company. It's been a great job today, so thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. it. I appreciate taking the time. Thank you.